Social Media and Information Systems. All right, well, our discussion today is from Chapter 8, and I got to say that this chapter is probably the chapter I detest the most out of this textbook. Um, it's not that I don't like social media. I think it's freaking awesome. And I think there's a tremendous amount of potential. But the way this book goes about describing it is wrong um, in, in several different ways. And I hope to uh, explain it to you as we go. And two, I think it's too narrow of a discussion on just on social media. I think a broader concept would have been far more powerful, which would be Web 2.0. Um, in fact, I'm going to provide a supplemental lecture um, in my in, in the notes for you guys to hear what's in Web 2.0, because I think that's far more advantageous for you to learn. So anyway, what is in this chapter? And let's let's get started. So. What, the first one is describing what is social media information systems. Um, and with that, we'll get into why is important, um, you know, the value of it, the, the purpose of it. Um, how does social media information systems advance organizational strategy? Uh, in question three, how does social media information systems increase social capital? Number four, how can organizations manage the risks of social media? And number five, where is social media taking us? Now, at this point, you know, I don't really have a problem with his overall definition of social media. Uh, use of IT to support sharing content among networks of users. Now, this isn't exactly what everyone else uses out there. There's slight different variations on the definition of social media. Uh, this is pretty close. Um, you know, it basically, though, you're, what you're using... I mean, if you think about media in general, so the media industry, it's about broadcasting information out to a large number of users. Um, and media is basically just the plural for medium. And so social media just means that there's a lot of ways of sharing content and usually in a very social context. So that means there's a lot of people interacting with each other when they're sharing content. Um, so in essence, it enables communities. So people related by a common interest. Now, depending on who you talk to, you're going to get different definitions of how, uh, what social media actually entails. Some, some people today love the term and apply it just to the advanced technologies that are out there today that enable things like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, but so you can also see that if you talk, look at the actual definition, things like the old fashioned discussion boards or discussion forums, or Usenet groups from way back in the day, um, it could also fit this definition. Um, and so you could say that social media has been around for quite a long time, um, for 20 or 30 years. However, the term has only really come up in very recent past. And really has been applied primarily to these new forms of social media where not only where you can create communities um, but it's a lot more dynamic in how you create the communities and you getting to choose which communities you join or even creating your own and inviting friends to it all right so what's a social media information system well, obviously, we talked about what an information system is, right? So it's not just, there's, there's five components, right? It's not just the IT, and it's not just the people, but you also have the procedures and how you interact. There's the data, there's the uh, software, and all of this interacts together. How does it interact? It interacts by, sh supports the sharing of content among the network of users. And generally supports the sharing between groups of users, uh, as well as a sponsor. So usually some company is sponsoring the social media platform. And there's a couple of examples they talk about in the book, like Pampers Village. So this is usually more for moms, as you might imagine, uh, that have kids in diapers. Or the HP Tech Forum, or one that I've used many years ago when I was doing development. Microsoft has their own tech forum as well. Um, uh, MSDN, I believe it is. So Microsoft Developer Network, and that was a website for de Microsoft developers. Now, another professor here at ECU, Tracy Tooten, developed, and she's a marketing professor, so she developed the four zones of social media. Now, this is not described in the book, but because I'm well aware of Tracy Tooten's work, I thought it was 
good enough. It was very important that we at least talk about it a little bit. So obviously marketing on social media has become a very important thing. In fact, Tracy Tutin teaches a class on social media marketing. Um, and, but she identified that there's actually four different zones, uh, where social media exists. And one is the social community. And that's essentially uh, you're, where you're sharing, socializing, conversing with people. I mean, Facebook and Twitter are two very, very common social communities. Then you have the social publishing. And this is things like blogging or um, YouTube, where you actually upload content, user-generated content, but you still have the ability to interact with each other. So like if you think about YouTube, right, you can write comments on posts, you can favorite things, um, you can follow different channels. So there's a lot of different ways you can interact with other people on that platform. Her third zone was social entertainment. Now, probably the most well-known of this would have been games, like social games. And this is not just like games on Facebook, but it can also include uh, interactive uh, games where a lot of people join the game in order to play. So one main big um, system now is World of Warcraft. And I don't know quite what the usage numbers are now, if that's the, the largest online multiple, um, the massive uh, game that brings you know, thousands, if not millions of people into the game at the same time. But it is well known, right? Uh, but it could not possibly include things like music and art. Um, and perhaps there, and I'm not as familiar with that uh, area uh, personally, but it, there's that potential, right? Um, and then lastly is the social commerce. So this is the ability to, uh, to integrate your uh, you, you think of social commerce as basically a subset of e-commerce, right? So you can have uh, an integration with when you're purchasing a product, you can share that purchase with your friends. Or, um, and then you may have seen this too, where it says, you just bought something from Amazon. Do you want to share this on Facebook? Um, it also includes the abilities of interacting more on the human resources side, where you have applications that allow employee interaction. And or even so like here at ECU, we use a program called Yammer, which allows an interaction of people on um, it's basically a social community, but it's designed specifically for running the business of ECU. All right, so that's the basic definition of social media and social media information systems. So what can we do with it? Well, and I think there's been a lot of pressure from companies in the past five years to create a social media account. And in fact, when I'm teaching a web development slash e-commerce class, I get a lot of students um, when they're looking at sites, they're like, well, why don't they have a Facebook page? And there's some good reasons why companies may not want to do that. So let's talk a little bit about that. How do social media information systems and uh, information systems advance organizational strategy? Because you remember from chapter three that strategy determines the value chains, right? The overall organizational strategy, competitive strategy. So this might be that they're, you know, the low cost leader uh, in their specific niche or something like that, right? Um, but by defining their value chain, it also determines what business processes they need to run the business. Now, if you remember, information systems are designed to support various different, different business processes. So in essence, what we're saying here, though, is that social media should support a business process. It's an information system, right? So it should be supporting some business process. And if you don't have that business process, why are you putting this in there? So the business process supports the value chain. The value chain supports the organizational strategy and it doesn't go the other way around. So the bottom line is you shouldn't use social media and business until you know exactly how it will support the business strategy. So should every business have a Facebook page? And the answer is no, not every business should. Now, 
it's great that this, and this is one of the problems I have with this chapter, because he sets this up for, right at the beginning that he, he makes it clear that not every business should do this. But later, he makes it, he basically implies that if you're not doing it, you suck as an organization, which I think is a really disvalue to you as students to, uh, to word it like that, right? Um, but it's, a, but we want to try to grasp is that, um, you know, you, you got to have a purpose. You got to have a reason to use these things. And it's not going to be of value to every business for every purpose and every business process. So you need to identify it very carefully not to screw this up. Now, he also goes into uh, basically describing two different kinds of communities um, that are important to commerce. And he defines, uh, you know, the defender of belief versus seeker of truth. And honestly, when I was reading through that, I didn't quite um, follow where he was going with it. I mean, I kind of get the basic difference between the two. You know, the defender of a belief is someone who already has a set of belief systems is going into this community, not so much to have that the belief challenged, but to um, continue to have it reinforced and developed. Um, versus a seeker of truth, while they do have a set of beliefs, the reason why they're joining a particular community is to learn more. And usually it's in an area that they're not already familiar with. Um, and this led to his breakdown of different activities that can be done in the value chains. So these are just suggestions as we're going forward here, and, and they shouldn't be seen as uh, the end all be all. So there's different activities in your entire value chain from sales and marketing, customer service, inbound logistics, outbound logistics, manufacturing and operations and human resources and human relations. Um, but can take different types of communities, can have a different focus on who is going to be in this social media network, um, different processes that it's going to support and risks inherent in with those. And so I'm not going to read through this entire table, but this should give you the, uh, an important view of how you go about um, using social media throughout the organization. And I do want to emphasize that this social media can be used throughout the organization in many different ways. So, for example, um, what I've heard about it is some really interesting examples of, you know, research and development, developing a new product, and they get stuck on this problem. And they don't know how quite to figure it out. What they do is they actually put out a call for people to um, solve the problem for them. Basically, they'll say, here, we have this problem. We'll give who, whatever person, whatever group of people can come up with an answer. We'll give them $100,000. And so it actually attracts people into this social media or social network to come in and try to solve this business problem or this maybe it's a product problem um you know and it, it's a lot of engineers maybe working on their uh, at home uh you know doing their own th on their own time but a hundred thousand dollars prize can be you know they might be willing to put in several months worth of work trying to solve this problem um and oftentimes this can be very successful. So the company that's putting out this call for problem solving develops this community. So seekers of truth community with a focus on designing a product or solving this problem to design a better product. Um, it's, it's a great tool for get, um, basically with something called crowdsourcing, we try to get the beliefs of the, or to get the group of a crowd and all the intelligence within the crowd to help solve a problem. Um, but this can be done in many different places within an organization. And that's what I want to really emphasize here. All right. Social media and the sales and marketing activities. So let's look at this in specifically. Because I think it's useful to see a, a couple other good examples. Um, so relationships between organizations and customers often is a very dynamic process. Um, and you want to develop this relationship with your customers so that they're going to want to continue to come back and purchase more products. Because and if you take marketing classes, you will learn this, that it's 
more expensive to find a new customer than it is to manage an on an engage an existing customer. So you want to keep your existing customers as long as you can and keep them involved. So you develop this relationship. Well, how do you keep that relationship going strong? And so this is where social media can help doing things such as creating a blog where you write up stories, maybe inspirational stories, or maybe about new products or new ways of using the products that you already have. You can develop discussion lists where your customers can all join and have an ongoing discussion. An FAQ, which isn't quite so social media, so I don't even know why they put this in the book, but it, uh, but perhaps this is based on the customer feedback. So the frequently asked questions, the more times they ask the questions, it can maybe even dynamically create a uh, FAQ. You can do user reviews. Now Amazon is great at this in commentary, right? So it helps develop the relationship. So users that are willing to review a product. Um, now, not all the times will these reviews be positive. And that's something you have to really judge as a company. Is it worth this? Or can I solicit reviews from people, from customers that had a positive experience? And the more you can get of those, the better um, and more, and, and I would imagine the better your results are going to be because it, it, it one, it, it engages the customer because then they have to really sit and think about the positive aspects to the product or service that they received, um, which helps them really appreciate what they got. Also, if you do get some negative reviews, hopefully they will help you to become better and avoid those problems in the future. But customers are likely to generate most business. Um, you do want to focus on the customers likely to generate the most business and give them the attention that they need. Now this can even spill over into customer service. So product users help each other solve problems. This is a great tool um, that a lot of businesses are really learning how to do. So if you create these discussion forums, people buy a product, usually more of a complex product, and there's maybe a problem with it. Well, and I see this in a lot of like car manufacturers. Um, the, and some of these so, uh, social media platforms are external to the car companies because they're very scared about putting this up there themselves. They shouldn't be, but they are. Well, still, you get a lot of these um, people that own these cars and they go there to these platforms to discuss common problems they might have with their cars and how to solve them. But this also allows you to sell to or through developer networks more successfully um, because you can have customers interacting and then drive them through the developer work networks. Now you do have some risk with this and that you may lose control if you have a lot of customers, specifically if they're there to complain. Um, but you know, hey, that's, that's something you have to really be proactive about addressing and make sure you're developing a product that's not going to have a lot of complaints. I mean, let's face it, that's probably the best solution to that. Develop a product that's not going to have lots of complaints. Um, and then uh, if there is a complaint, address it quickly and immediately in a very respectful fashion. All right, how about social media and manufacturing and operations? Well, I talked a little bit about crowdsourcing earlier, right? Um, this is this idea where you can get a lot of people together to work together and solve a problem um, that a company might be having. Now, they, uh, the book goes into a lot into Enterprise 2.0, which is actually um, based off of something called Web 2.0. And that's the supplemental lecture I'm going to make available. Um, this is a subcomponent of it. So a lot of what I discuss in that Web 2.0 also applies here. Um, in fact, everything that I'm looking at on here, search links, authoring, tags, extensions, signals, are all talked about in there in various different ways. <clears throat> but the idea is that um, when we develop this new way of looking at corporate work and or just in general how people interact with one another, that the internet really does facilitate these different components in a way that 
we really didn't realize when we first started developing web pages, we kind of took the traditional publishing industry model and just published things up there. And we didn't really take advantage of the interaction and the dynamic ability that the web does create. And now people are really starting to grasp how to use the networking part of the internet more than just the posting of content part. And it's creating a rethinking of how we put things up on the internet. So that, I mean, that's all I'm going to talk about Enterprise 2.0 here. I do encourage you to watch that lecture um, and read the book a little bit more on this. How about re home, human resources, right? Uh, well, you know, we already have emails and we have uh, capabilities of, um, you know, having meetings and sitting down and talking. Well, and that's all fine and dandy, but when you have large organizations, oftentimes the answers uh, to problems are really difficult to find because you don't know who has it. I mean, when you have an organization with 10,000 people, you don't know everybody in the organization. It's been possible for you to know everybody in the organization. And if you have a question, you may not know who to go to to get the answer. You may even ask all the people, you know, and all the your fellow employees um, for the answer if they know anybody, and they may not, because there's a lot of silos in in organizations, um, and and so it's difficult to really get to all the important information that you need. So what can human resources do to facilitate this? Well, you can use social media um, to help this communication by helping the free flow of ideas. So I mentioned before how ECU uses Yammer. Okay, you can think of Yammer as it's basically Facebook for business, right? And so only people at ECU have access to Yammer, um, but it allows us to communicate on a social media platform. Now, to be honest, it's really not used very much at ECU. Um, and honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if they discontinue usage of it in the not too distant future. In part because there's a lot of other ways of sending out information. Um, and so there's a lot of competing networks of communications. I don't think we have a very clear communication policy within the university itself, <clears throat> but we have a lot of tools and people will use a variety of different tools in different contexts but nothing uh, is really being done to help consolidate and make it stronger um, at this point. And maybe they're going to in the future. I don't know what their plans are. But how can it be done? Well, so there's, so there's different examples. Like SharePoint does have um, something called My Site and My Profile, which allows you to create your own personal blog and send out personal communications to what other people in the organization can follow. Um, and that that is one way. Um, but here's what you want to try to avoid, though. You want to make sure that when the information is being shared across the uh, organization, that the wrong things are not being shared, right? So there might be someone saying, oh, yeah, there's a new insurance policy coming down the line that will allow us to do X, Y, and Z. But that may not be correct. Maybe it only does X and Y and not Z. Um, so, I mean, and that, can, and that can have a major impact on um, your relationship with your employees. All right. The site could also become a defender of belief, perhaps mistaken beliefs or perhaps beliefs that stagnate the company so that it, it's not um, innovating and continuing to grow. Or it may uh, share unpopular management message. Like all employees must stop using external social media sites like Facebook and Twitter, um, which may not actually be true, or maybe it's true for one department, but not in uh, company wide. Um, so yeah, I mean, so there are dangers to doing this, and so that that is one problem with social media. It's basically the, basically false rumors, right? Um, false rumors. You want to try to avoid these and. But you do want to spread good messages and positive messages, and you want to help employees find the information, help customers find the information that they need, help vendors find the information that they need. All right, question three. 
does social media information systems increase social capital? Now, this is where I'm going to rail the strongest against this textbook because I am so incredibly annoyed with this section of the textbook. Um, I want to tear it out and completely replace it. Because number one, he starts with the definition of capital that comes from probably one of the worst economic uh, uh, economists of all time, Karl Marx. And if you want to know why he's so wrong, take a look at the practical application of his uh, economic theory, which is communism. And look at the countries that have been absolutely devastated because of that, right? It all starts with how he defines capital. So he says capital is resources that can be invested to create profit. Now you might be looking at it thinking, what's wrong with that? Well, that's not actually the purpose of capital or even a good definition. No. Um, in fact, I would probably, I would, would, the definition I think would be far more advantageous and leads to the best possible outcome is one that actually um, Ludwig von Mises said was capital are resources that basically it's capital resources that can be invested to create consumer goods. Now notice the fundamental shift in that definition, right? Capital is, are resources that can be invested to create uh, consumer goods. Now he has a slightly different way of wording it than that, but I'm, I'm basically trying to take what Karl Marx did utterly wrong. So because of this, because of his focus on profit, um, he basically, you know, demonizes the entire business community um, and the you know, economic system of capitalism based on this definition that, well, all they're doing is creating profit. So, but that's, that's not necessary. We can just do away with it. And that's essentially what it comes down to is that this, that's the only reason what, what pro resources are being used for. If we want to optimize our resources, we get rid of the profit. And then suddenly everything becomes fine and dandy. And actually that's not true. Resources are being invested to create consumer goods, which are of value to everybody. So the fact is capital is freaking awesome and amazing because the more resources we put to uh, creating consumer goods, the more consumer goods that we have and the better quality of life that we're going to have. Now, do you see how that small shift in definition makes a big difference? Now, where does profit fit into that? Well, profit fits into that as we make decisions about which consumer goods are the best things to invest in based upon expected profit into the future. And so capital tends to flow to where there's the greatest potential in consumer goods um, to, to increase the value to our lives. Now, the reason why I have this huge problem with this silly definition is because when he gets to defining social capital, it's based on this original definition. And I think, and when I looked at it and read, read through his discussion of social capital, to, it was absolutely disastrous. It is completely uh, Machiavellian in, in, in its view of mankind and our relationships to one another. Uh, it actually made me kind of sick reading it. Um, and it's definitely not anything I would want to promote. Um, so like I said, I want to rip this section of the book out. It is horrible. Um, now, here's a natural question some of you might be asking, which is, well, what do I need to know for the exam? And it's a stupid question at this point because uh, to me, he's being incredibly unethical. And I'll, I'll just throw it out there. It, it is unethical the way he's defining social capital. So yes, I actually reviewed the exam. Uh, I, there, if there is a question on social capital, it does not follow the same uh, fundamental error that is made in this book. All right, I'll just say that. Um, that being said, there is some value to wait to the discussion. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second here. Um, all right. So different types of capital. Yeah, that's fine. You can talk about different types of capital. Physical capital, um, would be resources. Again, this is resources that can be invested to create consumer goods. And these can be physical things. It can be human things. So like our knowledge and skills that can be used to invest it to, um, create consumer goods and social capital. Now, again, here is where he gets a disastrous because look at it, social relationships, the development of which are expected to generate returns. Now, the problem with this is that if you start looking about all your relationships, that only thing you're interested in is the return from the relationship. 
it makes all of your relationships absolutely disastrous. You don't think about relationships with people with what you expect to get in return from them. Um, you do it based upon this expectation, if anything, of a mutual trade. Um, but it can be that, you know, you would invest a lot of time into, so for example, um, you know, oh, you know, uh, I will say my family, right? Um, I don't invest in, I don't put a develop, um, that relationship because of the expected returns per se. Um, now that's not saying I don't expect to have a return from it, but that's not why I develop my relationship with them. Right. Um, so it, I mean, I, I think it's a very fine tuned difference here because it's focuses on the returns as in revenue or reduced support costs and yeah, and, and and so on. Whereas I believe a better definition of social capital would be increased value. That's uh, a mutually beneficial relationship between you and the person you're interacting with. So I think it is a fundamental shift at how you think about things. It's instead of thinking about um, money, you're thinking about the value that the relationships can bring. So it makes it far more uh, ethical in essence to do that. All right, how do social networks add value to businesses? Now, here's another place where I think the book does an incredibly bad job because he starts saying progressive organizations. And that's a horrible term to have to start calling them progressive because now it gives the impression that these are somehow better or they're more advanced than other organizations. And, and like we said earlier in the chapter, it depends on your organizational strategy and where social networks fit within to the value chain and business processes. So be that as it may. All right. Um, let's just say organizations in general, where can it, where do social networks add value to businesses? And that is an important question. Well, number one, you have to maintain a, so you basically have to maintain a presence on various different social networks. But what's important here is you have to encourage customers and interested parties to discuss in public, um, Enhance your visibility. You need you need to keep a frequent exposure, so a con, you know a continuous output of information, but it provides the opportunity to respond to problems before they become large. Now this can be an expensive uh, proposition because it says frequent exposure, which means someone needs to be managing this on an ongoing basis. You got to hire a person to manage this on an ongoing basis. That's expensive, and so yes, a business could do this, but it may not be financially viable at this point in time. So it's very, very important to be able to keep that in mind. Um, all right. So using social networks to increase the strength of relationships. So there's three ways to increase social capital. Um, here's one more way that I think is just bad, bad, bad. Uh, this first one, ask them to do you a favor. Um, I, you know, I'm sorry. I mean, I understand kind of where they're coming from when they make that re recommendation, which is if someone's willing to do you a recommendation, they're going to, um, that it basically means that they've already developed a social capital. I don't think that creates social capital. It shows that you already have it, but there's a lot of focus here on, you know, working, not just ask them for a favor, but ask someone of power for a favor. And I think that's how they word it in the book. Um, the idea is that, oh, be, they like having the power and this shows that they have the power. Um, and if you ask them for a favor, then they feel like, so you're basically trying to develop power, master slave relationships, essentially what it comes down to. And I mean, when you're talking power, that's essentially what you're trying to get to. And that again is wrong, 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 wrong. Um, it's not ask them for a favor. You ask them to, you should ask people for a trade. You want to develop social capital, find a way to trade. Now trade doesn't have to necessarily be economic trades. It can be something like trading recipes or trading, um, you know, knitting, uh, <clears throat> designs, or it could just be having a conversation with them where you're both interacting and sharing stories. Those are trades and they also develop social capital. You know, one thing I love to do is play board games with some friends of mine. Well, I'm developing social capital with these friends by playing these board games. And I continue to remain friends with them in part because of this, All right? Frequent inter interactions also strengthen relationships. Well, that's pretty common sense, right? Um, 
Now, this can be very difficult for people that are more introverted. And I'll be honest, I'm one of those people. All right. But from a business perspective, it doesn't matter. You shouldn't have a business that's introverted or extroverted. The fact of the matter is the more you interact um, as a business with your target group of people, the stronger the interaction is going to be. Now, hopefully you're going to keep it also not just not just interactions, but positive interactions. Right. So you want to develop a, a, a situation where they respect you, both your skills and your knowledge and your ability to solve their problems. Now, and then the third one, again, gets back to this really questionable uh, recommendation, connect to those with more assets. Again, it's, it's kind of a calculative um, let's see what we can get from other people type of um, a totally horrible idea. You don't connect to those with more assets. However, what you do want to do is connect with those, um, connect with those people of where you want to be in your organization and in your life, right? Um, so not necessarily where you're at, but where you want to be. So you want to try to, if you're trying to develop into a large company, Yes, you're going to want to connect with other large companies because that will give you a better perspective of how to get there. Um, and yes, they're, they, these other companies do have resources, but that's not why you connect with them necessarily. You connect with them because you have a better potential for increased trade and hopefully a very strong relating, trading relationship. So I kind of reject their definition of social capital at the very bottom here, which is uh, the number of relationships times relationship strength times entity resources. Um, it's to me, this is a very dangerous road to go down if you're going to define social capital this way, because it can lead to this manipulative um, method of trying to gain strength over other people. And I think that's just wrong. Um, a better definition would be something, I mean, no, the number of relationships is important, um, but it's not necessarily the, sh but what's important here is not just that a number of people um, that are aware of you, but that have, that respect you and are willing to trade with you. And that's going to be in part, not so much connecting with those with more assets, but with you developing a positive relationship and a positive set of assets that can people are going to want to trade with you. So I would say focus on value. Don't focus on this definite, you know, this this money bottom line. And you know, money is important for trade. And don't get me wrong, I love money. Who doesn't, right? But if that's how you're going to define social capital, I think we're going to run into a lot, a lot of problems because you're not defining it by fundamentals, which should be the value that's being created for sustaining your life and the lives of those people that you're interacting with. All right. I think I'm almost done ripping on the book, um, but we still have a couple more questions. Number four, how can organizational organizations manage the risks of social media? Well, Okay, so let's face it, right? Um, so it's just, let's suppose you decide to go forward and create these social media uh, uh, environments. Well, you have to develop some sort of policy for how you're going to actually interact with these social medias because there have been a lot of examples uh, where employees get into trouble on social media. And this is sometimes not even using the uh, actual, not only using social media for the business, but using social media outside of the business where the employee is talking about the business. Um, it's very important you to develop policies um, such that employees know their expectations. You also have to manage risk of employee communication, right? So employees will interact with people outside of your organization. That's going to be a given. The question is, how can you help? How, what can you do to, you know, make that interaction um, useful uh, and honest and not, you know, self-deprecating so that you destroy your own business? And you can't tell employees, 
you may not post anything on Facebook. Well, okay, and you can tell them that. Um, it's just going to piss off your employees, right? Not a good policy. Don't tell them, don't do this. Um, well, you can. Well, let me rephrase that. You can tell them, don't do certain things. But expecting them not to interact with people outside uh, your organization is a, can lead to all kinds of problems, right? So here was Intel's social media policy, and I think it's a pretty good policy. But number one is to disclose. Um, if you're going to disclose something, be transparent of who you are and your employer. Don't pretend to be someone anonymous or pretend to be someone you're not. Um, be very truthful. Point out if you have a vested interest. Um, but also be yourself. You know, Stick to your expertise. Write about what you know. Don't write about what you don't know. Um, and be, you know, if you don't know it, say, I don't know, you know, maybe it's something and you're an engineer and you're talking about something in marketing, or maybe you're in marketing and you're trying to comment on something about engineering. You just don't know. We'll say, I don't know about this aspect. All right. Uh, number two, and this is especially important for Intel who, you know, they're developing a lot of new products. Um, there is a sense of if you're going to interact with people outside of the organization, number one. Don't tell the secrets of the company, right? Um, and a lot of big businesses have, uh, you know, confidentiality agreements that you must sign when you come in saying you won't tell the company secrets, so on. Number two, don't slam the competition, right? Because it just looks bad. If all your employees are suddenly, you know, all the Intel employees are saying, AMD sucks and it's horrible and I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole, Right? Um, it, it gives a bad vibe about your organization that you like you're trying to overcompensate for your own problems, right? And three, don't overshare. Okay, so sometimes you know when you if you do decide to share, that's okay as long as it's not a secret and you're not slamming the competition. But don't share more than is absolutely necessary uh, to make your point, right? Because Otherwise, all this information might be get out there um, or, you know, you give out a little piece and somebody else gives out a little piece and someone else gets out a little piece. And before you know it, the secret that you're trying to hide is now known. All right. So oversharing can lead to that if you get enough of these overshares. Um, also, use common sense. So make sure you're adding value. Uh, keep it cool. Try not to inflame people or respond to every criticism. You know, this is a policy I use a lot of times on Facebook, which is, you know, if people are saying things that are pissing me off, I just stop responding. You know, and I am like, all right, or I'll just say, I don't want to respond to this anymore. Um, but also, admit mistakes, you know. If you screw up, say it. Or if you make a mistake and misstate something, say it and move on. All right. So what happens um, if you don't? Well, so here's the risk of allowing open con uh, contributions. Now, so J.P. Morgan had a, a huge disaster um, last year and obviously they've had some issues with their um, you know the whole finance industry recently well they thought they were going to on Twitter they were going to create this hashtag called ask J, JPM where people could ask their um, oh I can't remember the guy's name I think it was uh, Mr. Lee which was an executive in the company ask him questions about JP Morgan and, and it was supposed to be a positive experience, right? Within a very short period of time, I think it was within several hours after they started this, um, this promotion, they were getting bombarded by, uh, thousands and thousands of people using this hashtag to, to, to just trash JP Morgan. I mean, some of the questions that were being submitted were, you know, um, you know, let's see how long it'll take JP Morgan to find out, or how long will it take JP Morgan to figure out how to, um, make money off of ask JPM, uh, hashtag and, or so, or another question might be, uh, you know, what is it like to, uh, destroy people's savings yet still make a huge profit and you know it's this ridiculous type of questions um and it was a complete uh nightmare for their team um 
So, I mean, this can happen though, right? So you're trying to create user-generated content. You're trying to get interaction with your employees or your customers, but it doesn't mean it's always going to happen the way you want. So some of the risk of open contributions, you could get junk contributions, which include ads. And no, I, so for example, I have a blog. Um, actually, I have a couple blogs. Well, one of my older blogs, I don't really post that anymore, but I get anonymous posts or even posts by people's names that always have a link to some other website, right? It's junk contribution. They don't really have anything. To, this is the most fabulous thing I've read. Here, check out my site. I mean, that's that's the that's their um, uh, contribution to my comments, you know. And I usually just delete them right away because it's just stupid, right? But that that's a risk of user generated content. You might get inappropriate content. People with different political rant. Well, God, you get on Facebook, you'll see that political rants all the time. Um, but it is, it is a, you know, something that can happen often. You can get unfavorable reviews. Um, so not always a bad thing because, you know, you know, sometimes the customers can give you suggestions and, you know, identify what or where are the problems so you can help solve it faster, right? And most consumers know that your no product is perfect. Um, so it's not always the worst thing to get unfavorable reviews, but it can be a problem if you get too many of these and people will suddenly stop buying your product, even if there's a lot of value to it. And then there's this move, mutinous movements, um, which is where customers, and this is what happened to the Ask JPEM uh, disaster above, where the customers just started dumping on JP Morgan. And they just ganged up on them to try to, you know, embarrass the hell out of them. So how do you deal with these? Well, there's different ways, things you can do. Um, one, you can just leave it up there. So you have to kind of decide, is it worth leaving or um, should I respond to it? Now, if you do decide to respond, you have to respond in the right way so that it's not, um, you know, so there's another example I read recently. I believe it was called Amy's Baker's. Um, Amy's, Amy's Bakery or something like that. Um, and they started getting some negative feedback on their uh, Facebook page. And their response was to start name calling and degenerating or denegrating all their uh, people that were responding to them. And that was became even worse, right? So they made it, they made the, the response made the situation worse, right? So if you are going to respond, <laughs> do it in, in a good way. Um, lastly, you can just delete it. And like I said, I did that once uh, a few times with my blog when I started getting these comments from people, um, random people that were trying to advertise their sites online. But here's the thing. It's better if you can develop a policy on how to deal with these things. So, and, and then realize that sometimes you're gonna have to make exceptions, but you need to make this, you need to find some policy that's going to work, right? Determine how to deal with problematic content before engaging in social media. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself in really bad situations. So where is social media taking us? Well, it is allowing us to create value by interacting with our relationships. And that's where I want to focus, okay? Um, not where the book necessarily takes us, but at the end result is, yes, there is tremendous amount of value that can be gained from interacting with our relationships, customers, employees, vendors, business partners, third parties, yada, 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 right? The point being here is you, when you're, especially if you're trying to develop social capital is don't focus on, you know, the money, the end result, because that is, uh, it leads to all kinds of misbehavior if you do it that way. Rather focus on the creating of value for the relationship, for your, the people you're interacting with. Whether it's multimedia reviews, lots of information, customers determining what is next, is exciting, um, crowdsourcing, and so on. And as employers, you can provide the endoskeleton, in other words, the the um, the framework, the technology to support work of people outside their organization. All right. Okay. So let's review. Um, so question one, what is social media information systems? Um, so we define social media as these, uh, a user generated content 
contained within a community um, that allows the sharing of information. And an information system includes both the hardware, the software, the data, the procedures, and the people that are all involved with this. And it is very community focused, so there's a lot of people interacting with each other. And how does a social media information system advance organizational strategy? Well, it can at all the different places in the value chain and many different business processes. Now, it may, you know, a lot of organizations don't currently do this. It is something for them to explore and to see if they can advance their organization these ways. Now, question three is where I think they the book is disastrous is how does social media information system increase social capital? Yes, it can increase social capital if you use the right definition of social capital. So that remains very focused on positive change for people. Um, and that is where you see the value added. Uh, how can organizations manage the risk of social media? Well, the big thing is, is just understanding that there are risks involved with it and having a policy for dealing with it. Um, and if you have a business with a bad reputation already, be very, very careful about how you use social media because you might end up getting a lot of very negative feedback on these platforms. So where is social media taking us? Well, I think more and more organizations are seeing the value of social media in different parts of the value chain. And hopefully you see that as well, because a lot of you will be working in these organizations. Some organizations do it well. Some of them have not done it yet. So it tends to be very expensive so to do it well. So if you are, you can see tremendous value, but you have to be uh, careful at developing it in a very systematic way so that it adds value to your organizational strategy. Well, I hope you enjoyed this discussion um, and my little rant on the book. Um, and next time we will get into um, some special uh, discussions on knowledge management and business intelligence. Until then, take care.